again, the eyes of the world are centered on the UAW, the Union of the Automobile Workers. Here, called together by President R.J. Thomas, is the heart of an industrial union, the executive board. These men, elected by workers from every region, have met to solve the urgent problems of the tool and die makers. There are only a few thousand of these fine craftsmen, but without their work, a car could never be made. Their skill is sharpened with years of study. They forge the tools, they shape and cast the dies, true to a thousandth of an inch. Their accuracy of hand, eyesight and brain is vital to the automobile industry. In 1929, this man earned $4,000. In 1939, he scarcely made 1,000, an average of less than $20 a week. Such was the problem of the tool and die maker, the highly skilled worker, the pride of America. He grew rich by the hour, and he starved by the year. Thousands of cars rolled out of the General Motors shops, and the profits of the corporation for only six months in 1939, as President Thomas reports, were $100 million. But they refused even a nickel more to the tool and die makers. The union voted to strike if necessary. Through Walter Ruther, national director of the UAW General Motors Department, the press is informed of the facts. A crisis has begun. The union stands firm as a rump strike tries to smear the CIO with violence and lack of discipline. But the UAW will have none of it. They regard it as a provocation led by a traitor to the union. To them, it proves once more the death of craft unionism. The UAW, CIO, waits for the final answer of General Motors. We extend the hand of friendship to all loyal GM folks. We can see nothing right, to discuss, right, nothing to quarrel right, about. Right, our wages right, are right, entirely right, fair. Right, Every person in our big GM family is entirely satisfied with our policy. We never shirk the call to arms. We fear no danger or foe. Yes, we'll fight when we must for our cause is just. Oh, we fought our 
First blow of the strike. The men go back to work on the picket line. The factory is empty, and then the striking tool and die workers are joined by the engineers from GM's experimental lab. The strike is growing. Eleven plants down in five days. Detroit, Saginaw, Pontiac, Cleveland, Flint. The strike goes nationwide. Against these people, General Motors begins to fight with its millions of dollars, hoping to smash their union. The members of the UAW take up this challenge. They crowd the union office to pay their dues. Every cent, every dollar becomes a demonstration of courage, a proof of their faith in themselves and in the union which they built. 400,000 members can't be wrong. To break the spirit of this union, General Motors mobilizes the forces of law and order, hired men and hired guns. The Detroit police, who should be the servants of the people, have been forced to become the gangsters of a single corporation. They allow only four pickets. The workers cross into Hamtramck, where labor and progressives have a strong influence. And now, the power of money faces the power of union strength. The police yield, retreating before the spirit of the workers. They will allow ten pickets. Then a parade of workers' children crosses the boundary. Will they be met with clubs, or with bullets? The police yield again. Mass picketing is resumed. No scab could cross this line. Chevrolet gear and axle stays closed. But in Saginaw, they get an injunction. Raz, your petition to strike, we play the writ of 30 RV received in honor of the seal of this honorable court, directed to the Court of Errors Appeals of the State of Michigan. Man Act Court is certified and sent to this court with its determination. No picketing allowed. And further, we're asked from recluding members 1937, dependence from another constant restraint, first by adding the room state, containing the order to show cause and following the determination of the order to show cause by eliminating inductions down under the review. Private property. And taking due sufficient consideration, private real estate, if you are as if it was KXC, with the order on November 1970, maybe something else is restraining the affirmation of committing personal molestation with a tender and coerced injunction granted. What is this injunction? Well, it's a sheet of paper in the form of a cop. Is it a law? It's a law we never made. It's a one-man law. Okay, let's change the law. We will. But we've got to win the strike first. Then nothing can stop us. One an annual wage. We want an annual wage. We want an annual wage. We they ought to arrest the guy annual that breaks the Wagner Act. We want an annual wage. We want an annual wage. We, we make the cars and Wall Street gets wage. the gravy. We yes, beat up is enough to kill anybody. Wage. We want an annual 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 wage. We want. An annual wage. We want an annual wage. We want. An the weeks are going wage. by. General Motors relies on a show of force to break this strike. Force and hunger. But the tool and die shops are empty, and the picket lines are full, morning, noon, and night. 
The marching lines hold firm day after day in spite of provocation. These police have their own picket line. We want an annual wage. 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 An annual wage. The opposition of the city administration creates serious problems for the union. A committee for the international headquarters of the UAW in Detroit decides upon a course of action. As representatives of the auto workers and in the interests of all people who earn their living in the city of Detroit, they will go to the city council to voice their protest. President Thomas and Secretary Addis give them a final word of advice and encouragement. It would be far more effective if these men could go to the city hall, not as victims of police brutality, but as councilmen, elected under the emblem of labor's nonpartisan league. Labor already has several, but they must have more. They would not need to protest. They could legislate. They could break the power of machine politics. They could champion the people's cause in the legislature and the city hall. And these men, not the General Motors Corporation, could influence the police in the interest of the people. Meanwhile, there are 8,000 men on strike. That means 8,000 families that require food. The landlord can wait. Gas and light bills can be paid next month. But you've got to eat every day in the week and that includes Sundays and holidays. For this union kitchen, food must be obtained. As the weeks go by, labor finds a new partner. The farmers union has sent word to the UAW to come to the country. It offers to give the strikers as much food as they can carry. The farmers union asks only to see an empty basket and a paid up union card. That's the real spirit of Americanism. As the delegation drives into the countryside along this road that unites the farmer and the wage earner, they recall the impressive words of the John L. Lewis. The wage earners have been paralleled upon the farm. The farmer, in fact, has not known reasonably prosperous conditions since the end of the World War. Production in America proceeds as a partnership between industry and agriculture. Historically, at least, agriculture is a senior partner. Our industries find their raw materials and their greatest ultimate market in rural America. But the senior partner is in a very bad way. A nation of free farmers has been transformed into one of tenants and sharecroppers clinging precariously to the land upon terms dictated by remote financial control. The individual farmer who once held his destiny in his own hands now rents his farm from a New England life insurance company, buys his implements from an international machinery monopoly, and sells his products upon a market and at a price controlled by a Chicago speculator. In the days of the open frontier, individualism to the farmer meant exactly the same thing as self-government. That is no longer true. If the farmer is to achieve self-government now, he must do so 
by uniting with other farmers. Squadrons here again, the squads who came from way back when we used to call them Minutemen. Make way! For the flying squad! Coming through will make it great! Make it great! Make way! For the flying squad! Now General Motors and Fisher too, they sent down their boys in blue, but not a scab is gonna get through. Make way! For the flying squad! The workers are the squads who'll see that we have peace and liberty. We're going to keep this country free. Make way for the fighting squad. Come and free. Free. Come and free. 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 The flying squadrons riding find your power and strength to the picket line. We're going to make canoots and sign. Make way for the fighting squad. Two by two, then four by four. Eight by eight, eight then millions more. Make way. Meanwhile, the strike committee meets in permanent session. There are dozens of problems to be faced and solved every day. The city is filled with rumors of all kinds, some true, some false. The job of the committee is to find the truth, to plan and carry out the strategy of the strike. Only Fisher Body number one is out, but the committee includes representatives from every local in the city. Today, they decide to call a mass meeting of these locals, which will march with their banners to an open air meeting. They bring with them their manpower for the picket lines and their financial resources to feed the families of their striking brothers. To these men, many of them veterans of the great sit-down strikes of 37, Leo Kritsky of the clothing workers pledges the aid of every CIO union in this fight of the auto workers, welded in unbreakable solidarity, union brothers against the General Motors Corporation. That solidarity is heard. It's a fact. Every union man knew that the highly skilled tool and die men earned less than 1,000 per year. They knew, too, what the executives were earning. Kettering, 83,000. Knudsen, 124,000. A.P. Sloan, 164,000. And that doesn't count bonuses, either. No longer could anyone split the union ranks with the question of race or religion. Negro and white marched together on the picket line. They had one union and they were proud of it. Members of other unions, this truck driver for example, refused to cross the picket line and turned their trucks back from the GM gates. And again, as at Turnstead, the spirit of solidarity brought these women employees of the auto industry out to the picket lines, spending their noon hours, spending hours after work to support the striking tool and dye workers.
The outside tool and die shops seemed like an opportunity to General Motors to break the morale of the strike. The corporation's labor policy did not affect these shops, but when General Motors attempts to remove their dies, their trucks just don't get through. The union men from the Coleman plant refuse to be made into scabs. Assembled in a meeting inside their own shop, they promise George Addis, secretary treasurer of the UAW, that not a GM die will go out of this shop. Strike is a contest in which one side uses money and the other side courage and endurance. A man is worried sometimes that he won't hold out and often he gets tired and hungry and he worries about his family. He'll go over to the strike kitchen, it's run by the women's auxiliary, and he'll get a bite and a cup of good hot coffee. This place seems like home to him. It was set up and managed by the wives and sisters of union men. He begins to talk to one of the auxiliary leaders. Not about himself at first, but she can see that he's worried. Today is the 19th day we've been out. That's nearly three weeks. It's not so bad, but still it's not so good. My wife, my wife hasn't said much yet, but she reads the papers, and the papers seem to be all against us. It's a funny thing. Well, my wife has the idea we might lose, and she thinks we made a bad move. She says, I'm on the picket line, and anything might happen. And I try to tell her, I try to explain to her what it's all about, but she won't listen. You know how women are. She tells me I'm a family man, but I know that. That's just why I tell her we've got to fight. But somehow I can't talk to her the right way to convince her. I'm on the picket line and I'm there to fight for my kid and get a decent wage. But my wife, she's really a fine woman. But she sits home with a girl and she worries when I have to go out and do my union duty. It's tough. That's my story, he said to me. That's what he told me. And I promised him we'd do something about the trouble he was in. You know, a woman doesn't always trust what a man tells her. But a woman can talk to a woman because she knows just what's on her mind. it was about the little girl. What if she got sick, needed medicine? And we told her we had our strike fund. But she knew that. She was worried about something else. She was worried about right and wrong. Why were our men on strike and all this fighting? We told her there was a law, the Wagner Labor Act, and GM wouldn't listen to that law, had their own law brought in strike breakers from the outside, 
We call them scabs. R-A-T, scabs. Why, we told her we don't want fighting. We're willing to bargain collectively, according to the Wagner law. But GM breaks the law, brings in high-paid scabs, and then sends the police to club our men. Why should we have to do this? We only want a decent living wage. But then, bullets, tear gas. It's not right, it's not decent. My country, tears of the sweet land of liberty. This is America, and we're all Americans. We can't let this happen to our country. She could see that. She understood we couldn't back down and forget all the things we believe in and let them put a stain on the name of America. She said, what could she do? And we told her to come down to our strike kitchen and give us a hand. Not to stay at home and brood, but to get into this fight, back up her man, and know what it's like to be part of a thing that's bigger than you are. The Pontiac Strike Committee faces a new situation. The Fisher plant management has long disregarded the rights of labor, and now they have the cooperation of a controlled police department. The corporation's plan is to bring scabs into the city, professional strike breakers at $15 a day, and smash through these picket lines with high-speed cars, regardless of how many strikers they may injure. The union resolves not to let them through. Police have arrived, brave men with the usual clubs and ammunition, eager to protect the property of General Motors against those wicked pickets. In protest against this un-American display of force, the Union leaves the factory unguarded. But not a single scab enters the empty factory gates. Ten 
minutes later, the citizens of Pontiac, the strikers, members of other unions, whole families marching together, stage a demonstration of solidarity that no one who has seen it will ever forget. This is the real America, its people. The General Motors officials have played their last card. This strike just can't be broken. They will meet a negotiating committee, which includes Philip Murray, sent by the National CIO to help the strikers. The committee itself is headed by President Thomas, and it has, behind it, the courage of the strikers, the determined pressure of all the production workers, and a sample picket line around the GM building. Of a Chevrolet, it's just a GM Chevrolet. I'll sing you a song about a Chevrolet. It certainly has seen a better day, for it was made in 1928. Yes, sir, yes, sir, born in 28. She's broken down and out of date. She's broken down and out of date. She's broken down and out of date, but when she was born she wasn't late like Papa Sloan's 1940 model. Yes, sir, yes, sir, when she was born she wasn't late like Papa Sloan's 1940 model. United Action brings victory. The people have won again. GM signs a new contract. Increases of 10 and 20 cents more per hour. Time and a half for overtime. Double time for Sundays and holidays. Never stop till we are on top. For we are the CIO. Oh, we fought our union's battle. From Flint to Old Monroe. We beat GM on every front. Returning low with low. Yes, we'll fight when we must. Victory, that's a sweet word, something to celebrate. The UAW-CIO got sole collective bargaining in 42 GM plants. They thought they'd break the union this time, but the tool and diamond fought back and won. For everybody, for 400,000. And so, the men go back to work, swinging the heavy dies and grinding the tools for 30 million automobiles, which run north, east, south, west, on broad highways of this country. Yeah, right.
who build the cars for America have learned to forge their own future. And under the elected leadership of their union, which has led them in many a bitter struggle through hardship to final victory, they will go forward to their rightful place in American life toward winning the good life for themselves and for their families and for America.